looking forward and not complaining about life here on this earth at all, but I'm looking forward to when those footsteps end at the throne of Jesus. And one day when we are gathered around with Him, and one day when we will spend all of eternity with Him. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day and looking forward to that time. I hope you know where your eternity is going to be. I hope you know where your footsteps are going to take you. I hope you know that this morning. We'll be in John chapter number 10 again this morning. John chapter number 10, you get your Bibles, we'll be there in just a moment. Have you ever heard someone make an unbelievable claim before? Maybe you've watched and seen some commercials on TV or you hear these advertisements on the radio, stuff like, we cut this boat in half and we taped it back together with this tape and we can, it'll stay afloat and look at us going. And uh, well, I don't know about you, but I'm not in the habit of getting in boats that have been cut in half and put back together with tape. All right, I'm not, if the tape works for you, that's great and that's fine, but I'm not in the habit of trusting tape quite that much. Or you hear stuff like, take this pill and you'll never be hungry again. You know, it's like, that's, that's, I don't care what I do, I'm going to be hungry a couple hours later. That's, that's just the way life is. It doesn't work that way. How about, invest in this and you'll never have to work another day in your life. You hear all of these commercials and you hear all of these uh, claims that are made and you're just like, mm, you, you know, I don't, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. You know, there are some people throughout time who have made some pretty unbelievable claims. There's a guy that's in Australia right now by the name of Alan John Miller who claims that he is Jesus of Nazareth through reincarnation. And uh, he, he says that he's not at the point in time in which he can do miracles because Jesus didn't start to do miracles until he was of around the age of 30 or so. And this guy says that he didn't really understand that he was Jesus until he was about 40. So I guess he has until he's 70 to be able to do miracles in, other words, in order to prove that he is who he says he is. He says that he doesn't communicate to God through words, but rather he communicates to God through the medium of interpretive dance. His wife claims to be Mary Magdalene reincarnated. This guy isn't the only one. All throughout time, there have been people. There's a, a person, guy by the name of Krishna Venta. In 1948, he stated that he was the Christ, the new Messiah, and he claimed to have led a convoy of rocket ships to Earth from an extinct planet. So there, there's, you know, if you don't believe in aliens, apparently you should now because... That guy was one of them. William Davies was a leader of a Latter-day Saints group that was called the Kingdom of Heaven. He taught his followers that he was the Archangel Michael and that he had also lived previous, his previous lives as the biblical Adam and Abraham and David. When his oldest son was born, his oldest son, his name was Arthur, but he said he was Jesus Christ. When his second son was born, he said that he was God the Father. I mean, there are people who have made unbelievable claims. Maybe you've never heard of some of those people before, but maybe a name like David Koresh you would hear, and you would, uh, some of you in here go, yep, know exactly who that guy was, and the whole debacle and everything that happened at Waco, but he was the one who claimed that he was the Messiah of the Branch Davidians, and that did not end well there. Perhaps you would know the name Jim Jones, someone who he claimed he was God. Uh, he claimed to be the reincarnation of Jesus, Buddha, and Gandhi. And uh, there was a great massacre at Jonestown, Guyana in 1978 with Jim Jones. Some of you would be able to go back to and remember some of that. And there have been people who have made unbelievable claims, and yet at the end of their life, nothing came of it. Because they died like every other person, and nothing took place. They didn't come back. They, they weren't able to ever prove that which they said. I want you to go with me to John chapter number 10 this morning. We've been looking all throughout the book of John, and we've been seeing some unbelievable claims that Jesus made. Again and again and again, Jesus has said that He was equal with God. Again and again, Jesus has claimed to be God. We've seen that again and again throughout the book of John. In John chapter number 10, 
I want you to look with me down to verse number 22. The Bible says, And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. We looked at last week, we were talking in John chapter number 10 about Jesus talks about being the, the door of the sheep. And he talked about being the good shepherd and we looked at that. This conversation that we're picking up with today is about two and a half to three months after that conversation. The Bible tells us now that it's the time of winter. This feast of the dedication, it was a feast that was not in the Old Testament and that was prescribed by the Lord in the Old Testament, but it was a feast of what is celebrated by Jews today as Hanukkah. And that's the time that the Bible's talking about here. It says it's the time of winter, and that's where Jesus is at. And the Bible tells us there in verse 23 that Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Look at verse number 24 with me. The Bible says, Then came the Jews round about and said unto him, how long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Look at verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believed not. I told you, and ye believed not. In the scriptures today and in this passage, we are going to see once again that Jesus is Christ the Messiah. He is God in the flesh, and He proved who He said that He was. Today I want to preach a message with this thought, three reasons why we believe Jesus was and is who He said He was. I hope you believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. I hope this morning that you believe that He was the Messiah. I hope that you believe this morning. For those of you that are watching, I hope you know the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to go through this passage of Scripture this morning. We're going to talk about three reasons in particular why you and I can still believe, why the people of His day should have believed, and why you and I today can still believe that Jesus was exactly who He said He was. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into this passage and go through the Scripture this morning. Father, I pray that as we come to you this morning, I pray for the time together in your word. Lord, I pray that you would use the message this morning. Lord, if there's one that's watching, if there's one that is here present with us this morning, and they do not know you, they've not put a faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I pray that today would be the day that they would turn from their sin and turn unto you, trust you by faith, call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to save them. Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning for, for those of us who know you. I pray that we would be comforted by the scriptures and be comforted by this passage this morning in knowing who you are, that you are in control of all things, and that you are God. Lord, I pray this morning that you would be with me. Use me this morning, I pray. Give me clarity of mind and give me clarity of speech this morning as I preach your word. Fill me with your Spirit's power, I pray, that I may be able to preach the Word this morning. I thank you for those that are here and for those that are watching. I pray that you bless them and use this time together for your honor and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name that I do pray. Amen. I want you to go back to the Scripture now here and look with me. In verse number 26, Jesus said unto them, He said, Ye believe me not, in verse number 26, Said ye believe me not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Then he's going to go through in the next couple of verses. He's going to give a few marks of a believer. What is a believer and what do they do? Look with me very quickly here in verse 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice. Let me give you three marks of a believer. Number one, a believer is one that listens to Christ's voice. In other words, he is one that listens and would listen to the word of God. Yeah, that's a mark of a believer even today as someone that would listen and follow the Word of God. You know, the Bible tells us again and again, flip back to John chapter number 8 here in John chapter 10, just flip back a page or two. John chapter 8, verse number 31, what did Jesus say? He says in verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in My word, then are ye My disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know, there's truth in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is truth, the Bible says. There is truth in His Word. You want to be a believer? You want to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? You want to be His disciple? Get into His Word. Continue in His Word. Believe and follow. Listen to His Word. The Bible says that's a mark of a believer. 
You say, I don't care about the Word of God. I I don't don't have to follow that thing. I don't want to, you know, it, it just gives me a list of rules and stuff. You've misunderstood the Word of God. You've misunderstood the purpose of the Word of God. You've misunderstood. Listen, but as a believer, we ought to have a care and a love for the Word of God. You ought to want to be around the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. By the way, can I just say Sunday morning is not the only time here that we have preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Sunday nights, Wednesday nights are a great opportunity to come together. When we are able to have Bible studies together, those are great times to be able to come together to hear the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. Nothing is greater, though, in the Word of God than you having the opportunity to freely have it for yourself and to every day get into the Word of God and hear and read and hear from the Lord and hear from the Word of God. And Mark of a believer, listen to Christ's voice. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And then look what he says in verse 27, And they follow me. They follow me. You know what else marks a believer? Is that they have a love like Christ, and they live like Christ. Jesus said, My believers, my sheep, guess what they're going to do? They're going to follow me. As the shepherd, he said, I'm going to lead the way, and they're going to follow after. You know, Peter talked about walking in the footsteps of Jesus, about following after the Lord. Let me ask you this morning. Do you have the mark of a believer as far as following after the Lord and living like Him? I understand nobody's perfect. Nobody is ever going to get to a place of sinless perfection here upon this earth. We are always fighting the old man. We are always fighting the flesh. But do you strive every day to be more like Christ than you were yesterday? Are you striving right now to live more like Him than you did last year? Are you striving to grow closer in Him with your relationship or are you getting farther away? The mark of a believer, the Lord said, is that the, his sheep would hear his voice and they would follow him. Then notice what he says. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Jesus talks here about the third aspect of being a believer is that you have eternal life. A mark of a believer is one that they would hear the Lord's word, that they would follow after him, and that they would have life eternal. Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life. This is one of the greatest passages that we use to talk about the doctrine of eternal security. You say, what in the world is eternal security? It means that once we're saved, Jesus says that we are in his hand, and then he says that we are in the Father's hand. He says, and no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. Guess what? Once you're his, you can't not be his. Amen. Once you've become the Lord Jesus Christ and you're in his family, you can't get out of his family. You say, well, oh, well I don't understand that. Well, this, this person over here, they teach that you, you sin and you lose your salvation. and you, you know, the Bible says 30 times... The Bible talks about eternal life. 30 times that phrase is used, eternal life. 15 times the Bible talks about everlasting life and uses the phrase everlasting life. Let me ask you, what does the word eternal mean? Okay, it's not a trick question this morning. What does the word eternal mean? It means eternal. What does the word everlasting mean? It means everlasting You know what that means? Uh, Everlasting and eternal means always and forever without end. So let me ask you, how can you get eternal life, which is forever and always and and forever lasting, and then lose it? How can you have something that's forever and then it be taken away? There are a lot of false doctrines and false teachings out there that, listen, you've got to do this to keep your salvation. Look, you've got to do this. Listen, can I tell you this morning that I'm glad I don't have to do a thing to keep my salvation or I'd be in a lot of trouble. And so would you this morning. If you had to walk out those doors and think, every time I sin, I lose it. Well, well, it's every time I commit a big sin. You you go ahead and qualify sins and tell me which one's big enough that can make you lose your salvation. The Bible doesn't teach anything of the sort. The Bible says Jesus gives them eternal life. He says, and you're in my hand, and you're in the Father's hand, and nobody can pluck you out of my Father's hand. Nobody can do that. There's no way you can lose this eternal life. I thank God this morning that as a believer, I don't have to worry about losing the life that the Lord Jesus Christ has given me. I'm glad I don't have to worry. Now, that doesn't mean that I go out and I have a license to sin and do wrong. You understand that. We understand that we don't just have a credit card to slide every time. Just, well, thank God for God's grace. I mean, here we go. Let's just sin again. Okay, that's not the picture either. Okay, that's not what eternal life does for us. 
But eternal life does give us a confidence in Him and knowing that He is good and that He has granted us eternal life and we can trust in that. I hope you know the Lord this morning. I hope you follow His Word. I, I hope that you hear His voice and follow Him and, and I hope you know that you have eternal life. These are three marks of the believer that Jesus gives. Now let's go back now to verse number 25 and back up just a little bit in this passage. I want to start there with verse 25 and I want to give you three reasons why we can believe that Jesus Christ is who He said He was and still is today. They asked Him, they said, if thou be the Christ, just tell us plainly. I love Jesus' response. Look at verse number 25. Jesus answered them, I told you. <laughs> I told you. I have been telling you again and again and again. Let's just go through some of this in ju just in the book of John that we've been looking at in the book of John, okay? In John chapter 5, Jesus said in verses 17 and 18, He talks about, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. In other words, He was saying that He was equal with the Father. They were saying, You can't work on the Sabbath day. And he says, My Father works on the Sabbath day, and I'm just like my Father. I can do that, and I have the authority to do that. In John chapter number 5, in verse number 20, He said that He had the power to raise the dead. And He said, I have the same authority as... As the Father does. In John chapter number 5, verse number 22, he said he should be honored like the Father. For those reasons and for those things, they took up stones and they're going to stone him. Why? Because they knew he was making a claim to be God. They knew he was making a claim to be equal with the Father. And so they pick up stones to stone him. In John chapter 5, verses 37 through 47, he says there to them, You don't believe the scriptures. You, you're, you don't believe what Moses wrote you. He said, how can you believe my words if you don't believe the Scriptures? In other words, he was saying, the Scriptures, they testify of me, he said. You think that you have eternal life in the Scriptures, and the Scriptures are what testify of me. They testify that I am who I have said that I am. In John chapter number 6, in verse 33, he talks about the bread of life which came down from heaven. In John chapter 6, in verse 46, he basically tells them, he says, I am of God. And I have seen the Father. In John chapter 7, verses 25 through 32, the, the, the people are asking, they say, do the rulers think that this is the Christ? I mean, do, do the other Jewish believers, do they think that he's Christ? But then they say, wait a minute, we know where Jesus is from. We know who he is. He can't be the Christ. And then this is Jesus' answer to them. Jesus cries out, the Bible says, and he tells them, I am from God and I know him and he sent me. In John chapter 8, he says that he was not alone, that the Father had sent him. In John 8, 23, he said, I'm not of this world. And they said, well, who art thou? And he said, the same thing I've been telling you from the beginning. In John chapter 8, 58, he makes an astounding claim. He says, before Abraham was, I am. He was saying, I am the Jehovah God. I am God Almighty. And once again, what did they do? They took up stones to stone him because they said, you're making yourself equal to the Father. You're making yourself the Son of God. You're making yourself God. In John chapter number 10, last week we saw that Jesus said he had power to lay down his life and he had power to raise it up again. Who can do that but God? The, the person, they, 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 they eat, every time that this happens, somebody picks up a stone. Somebody says, stop making yourself equal to God. Somebody says, stop calling yourself the Son of God. Somebody says, that's blasphemy. You can't call yourself God. And here, once again, they say, well, well if you're Christ, why don't you just make it plain? And Jesus says, I did. I told you. You see, the first reason why we can believe is just simply the, the words of Jesus. He said it again and again and again. Let me ask you this. What do you call someone who doesn't tell the truth? A liar. What do you call someone who consistently does not tell the truth? We call them a pathological liar or a habitual liar. You lie again and again and again. Let me ask you, we've just gone through a partial list of all the times that Jesus claimed to be God and said that He was from heaven and that He was the Son of God and that He was equal to God. These are the words of Christ written down for us and kept for us for all of eternity. This is who He claimed to be again and again and again. He's either a liar or He is the Lord. He is either a flat-out liar or else he is who he said he was, and he's God. Uh, but the Bible says 
that a liar, someone who was wicked, they could not have done the things that Jesus did. Someone who was that evil could not have done all those things. So what should we take him at? We should take him at his word. And he said to them again and again and again, I am God. Notice if you look over to John chapter 10 where we're at right now, go ahead and flip over to verse number 30 and look at that with me. He says once again to them, I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. What do they do again? They take up stones to stone him. There's some irony in all of this in that they come to him. And listen, we understand that in the scriptures at times there is sarcasm and there is people saying things that they don't really mean. Guess what? The Jews didn't really mean it. They didn't really mean what they said. If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. No, he had told them again and again. They're just looking for one more reason to try to turn against him. And he tells them very plainly, I and my Father are one. And so what do they do? Instead of saying, thank you for making it so plain to us. Thank you for that. No, what do they do? They pick up stones one more time to try and stone him. Why? Because he said he was God. He was making it plain. The words of Jesus are one of the first things that we have that prove that he was who he said he was. Because in everything that he did, there was nothing else that he said or did that he told a lie. Why would we think that he was lying again and again and again about all this? We have the words of Christ that prove that he was who he said he was. Second of all, notice this. We not only have the words, we have the works of Jesus that tell us who he was. Go back to verse number 25 again, and the Bible says there, Jesus said, I told you, and ye believe not. Now notice what he says, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Flip forward now to verse number 37, and he goes through, if you were to back up, read, read those verses later, but they pick up stones to stone him, and he asks, you know, for what work are you going to stone me? And they say, not for the good work that you've done, but because that you make yourself equal with God. And he says, you've spoken blasphemy. Look at verse number 37. Jesus says to them, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is me and I in him. Jesus says, listen, not only have I told you that I am God, but all the things that I have done, they have showed you who I am as well. Listen, we don't have time this morning to go through every single work that the Lord Jesus Christ did. But let me name just a few that we've looked at and seen already through the scriptures. Jesus there, let me break these down to a couple of categories for you. First of all, he had power over nature, and he showed that power as he turned the water into wine. He showed the disciples his power over nature when they were out fishing, and he said, they said, we've been out all the night and have caught nothing. He says, cast your net on the other side, and the Bible says that they cast their net on the other side, and they couldn't pull in all the fishes because there were so many. Jesus calms a storm in the middle of the sea. He feeds 5,000 women and children, or he feeds 5,000 men plus women and children. He walks on the water. He feeds 4,000 in Mark chapter 8. He feeds 4,000 men plus women and children. One day Peter goes fishing and catches a fish and goes and pays his taxes out of the money that's in the fish's mouth. How many of you would like to have another miracle like that happen and be able to go catch a fish and every time you fish, fishing, just open up his mouth and took it out and here, it's tax time, let's just go fishing, he'll take care of it. But Jesus had power over nature, he could do those things. He had power over diseases. John chapter number 4, Jesus heals the nobleman's son at Capernaum. Jesus heals mother's Peter-in-law. Jesus heals many sick and oppressed at evening, Luke says in Luke chapter 4. He cleanses a man with leprosy in Matthew chapter 8. He heals the centurion's paralyzed servant in Capernaum in Luke chapter 7. He heals the paralytic who was let down through the roof in Matthew 9. He heals a man with a withered hand in Mark chapter 3. He heals the woman in the crowd with an issue of blood in Matthew chapter 9. He heals the two blind men. He heals the man who is unable to speak in Matthew 9. He heals the 
the invalid at Bethesda in John 5. He heals the sick in Gennesar as they touched his garment. He heals the blind and the deaf and the dumb. He heals the man we looked at just a couple of weeks ago, a blind man from birth, and he spits upon the ground and he makes clay and he puts it upon his eyes. He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he goes and he washes and he's healed of his blindness. And everybody says, has, it been, has anyone ever seen that, that someone could heal a man that was blind from birth? Has anyone ever seen this? And the man even testified and said, how is it that you don't know who he is or where he's from when he's healing the eyes of someone that has been blind from his birth? How do you not know who he is? Again and again and again, Jesus showed through his works that he had power over diseases. He showed that he had power over demons. He drives out an evil spirit from a man in Capernaum in John or in Mark chapter 1. He casts the demons into the herd of swine. Remember that whole account that took place there. He heals the Gentile, Gentile woman's diseased uh, and demon-possessed daughter. He heals the boy with an unclean spirit in Luke 9. He heals the blind, mute demoniac in Matthew chapter 12. And I love the passage that Jesus goes over to the country of the Gadarenes and there's one who is in the tombs and, and he comes to him and he falls down before Jesus. And there's the demons that are in him and the, the names are legion because he had so many demons that were in him. Jesus cast them out there. And the Bible says that when Jesus did that, the man came and they saw the man clothed in his right mind and sitting before the Lord. Why? Because Jesus had power over those things. Then he showed the power that he had over death. He raised the widow's son from the dead in Nain. He raised Jairus' daughter and brought her back to life. But we haven't even made it to Lazarus at this point in time. We haven't made it to Jesus' own death and burial and resurrection. But he said last week, hey, he said, I have the power to lay down my life and take it again. Jesus says, listen to me. If you won't believe me because of what I say, look at everything that I've done. Look at all that I have done. My works, they tell you who I am. My works show you that I'm from God. My works show you what I have accomplished and who I am. And yet for all of that, the Bible says they would not believe. But that's what the Bible tells us that we are able to believe because we see all of what Jesus did. We can read the Word of God and, and know that it is of truth and know that there's never been anyone like Jesus. There's never been anyone who has been able to do what He has done. And He was exactly who He said He was. Let me give you the reason number three here. Reason number three, we see not only the words of Jesus and the works of Jesus, but then we see the witnesses of Jesus as well. Skip with me to the end of the passage there in John chapter 10. In verse number 40, the Bible says that, they sought to kill him. They were going to take him. But verse 39 says he escaped out of their hand. In verse 40, it says, He went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. And many believed on him there. Now, I understand that it wasn't John in and of himself that saved them, but notice that John was a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, verses 6-8 through eight there, the Bible says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. It wasn't that all men through John might believe, that all men through Jesus might believe, but John was a witness of the light of Jesus. It says specifically there in verse 8, he was not that light, John wasn't, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. You got to understand something. Here we are about three years later from when all of John's testimony of who Jesus was and John's preaching and all that, we're three years down the road at this point in time from Jesus' baptism. Here in John chapter 10, I know we're only halfway through the book of John, but we're only about three to four months away from Jesus' crucifixion. We're coming upon the last few months of his life here in the book of John. And here John the Baptist has been a witness and testimony years before. And guess what? The truth of John's witness is still ringing loud and clear in the lives of these people. In so much that they said, John, he, he, he didn't do any miracles, but everything that John said about Jesus has come true. 
See, G- G- John was the one, he was the one that was preparing the way of the Lord. He was the one that Isaiah had prophesied about, that, that there would be a forerunner to the Lord Jesus Christ, a forerunner to the Messiah. And John bare witness. In other words, he preached about Jesus. He talked about Jesus. Remember how he told the people, there's coming one that that I'm not worthy to even unlatch his shoes. There's coming one that is going to be the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sin of the world. There's coming one that is going to be greater than me. He says, I'm nothing. He must increase, but I must decrease. And again and again, John gives testimony to that. Again and again, John gives testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here are these people, years later, they say, Hey, wait a minute. Everything that John said was true. Everything that John said was right. Miss Stephanie, could you help me out over here? Thank you. Everything that John, back up here, we'll get back to it, back up. John says, or these people say, everything that John said was right and true. Everything that John talked about Jesus was right and true. He gave a witness of Jesus, and years later the Bible says these people believe on him. John the Baptist? No, they believe on Jesus because of John's testimony and because they remember that. What is it that you and I still have today that we can look back to and when people say, why do you believe in Jesus? Why do you believe in Him? Well, we can look to the words of Christ. We have the Word of God. We can look at His works and see what He's done. And we can see the witnesses. We can see what Jesus Christ has done in people's lives. By way of application, let me ask you this this morning. Number one, do you believe in Christ's Word? Do you believe in Christ's Word? Do you believe in the Word of God this morning? There's an old preacher, I like the way he said it. He said, I'd believe God's Word if it said Jonah swallowed the whale. And so, uh, do you believe... Some of you didn't get that. You'll get that here in a little bit. So, I, No matter what the Word of God says, I'm going to believe it. No matter what the Bible says, you know, when, when it seems confusing and when there seems like there's something out of place, when it seems like there's something that's not quite right, guess what? We ought to study and go a little bit deeper because it's not wrong. The Word of God has never been wrong. The Word of God is not going to be wrong. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing what? By the Word of God. There is a measure of faith that says, I choose to believe what is written in the pages of this book. There is a measure of faith that says, I am trusting the Lord to be true and His Word to be true. Well, what does the Bible say about Jesus? It tells us again and again plainly that Jesus was God, that He was who He said He was. John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's what our Bible says. It's either true when it says that, or it's wrong if it says that, when it says that. I choose to believe that it is true, and for, therefore I choose to believe that Jesus was God. I choose to believe that he was exactly who he said he was. Spurgeon said, I would recommend you either believe God up to the hilt or else not to believe at all. Believe this book of God, every letter of it, or else reject it. There is no logical standing place between the two. For the life of me, I do not understand someone who goes through and says, well, I believe this part and this and this and this, but I can't believe this and this and this. Well, I believe what the Bible says concerning my salvation and eternity, but I can't believe what the Bible says about creation. I believe what the Bible says concerning the things of Jesus, but I don't believe what it says concerning things in the Old Testament. Well, I think we should live like what Jesus taught and what Jesus said, but we shouldn't live everything that the Bible tells us. No, the Bible says you either believe all of it or or you shouldn't believe any of it. I mean, It's there. Believe the Word of God. Let me ask you, do you believe in God's Word this morning? Do you believe not only in Christ's Word and in God's Word, but do you believe in Christ's works? Do you believe in what He has done for you? You know, the greatest work you could believe in is His work on the cross. The greatest work you can believe in is His death, burial, and resurrection. It is through that work that you and I are able to be saved. It's through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that you and I are able to have salvation. Do you believe this morning? Do you believe in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ? A young man over a century ago came to Billy Sunday, the evangelist, and he came to him, and he came running up to him, 
And Billy Sunday was out, and they had already finished the meeting. They were taking down the tent and putting the tent away. And the young man came up to him and he said, Sir, he said, I wanted to make it to your meeting. And he said, I wanted to get here. And he said, I wanted to hear the message. He said, and I know I'm late and I didn't get to. He said, he said but, but what can I do to be saved? And Billy Sunday said to the young man, he said, you're too late. And he just continued to put away the tent. And he said, Sir, he said, he, he said I, I, I didn't mean to miss the meeting. I didn't want to. The Lord's been dealing with me. He said, I, I, I want to know what can I do to be saved? Billy said, Sunday said to him once again, he said, young man, you're too late. He said, the Lord Jesus Christ already did all that had to be done 2,000 years ago. All you have to do is now receive it and believe it. There's nothing you can do for your salvation. Do you believe in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, though? Have you put your faith and trust in Him? See, that's the greatest work that the Lord Jesus Christ did. Your relationship starts there. You say, well, I, I can't believe all the things that are in the Bible. I can't believe all that took place there. Listen, let's start with your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you put your faith and trust in Him to do for you what you cannot do for yourself? Have you put your faith and trust in Him for your everlasting and eternal life? Let me ask you this. If you answered yes to questions one and two, you say, yes, I believe the Word of God, and, and yes, I believe in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done for me, and I believe that He was God in the flesh and that He was exactly who He said He was. But that's wonderful. Let me ask you this, number three then. Are you being a witness for Him like you ought to be? Are you being a witness for Him like you ought to be? Because if you believe the Word of God and you believe the works of God and you put your faith and trust in Him, are you being the witness because there's someone out there just like these other people who needed to hear the witness of John and who along with that witness they were able to say, yes, Jesus is exactly who John said he was. Yes, Jesus is exactly what somebody told me he was. Who's the last person that you simply told about the Lord Jesus Christ and told about what he'd done in your life? And one of the greatest arguments of Christ's authenticity is the truth of changed lives. You think about the disciples as we go through. The Bible says that people were amazed at what they knew and how they spoke. Why? Because they were unlearned and ignorant men. They'd never gone to school to learn about the Bible. They were fishermen. But yet they spoke with power and authority because Christ had changed their life. Think about Paul, someone who was very religious, who was very schooled, yet he was a murderer. He stood there as Stephen was being stoned and held the coats of the men who put Stephen to death for trusting in Christ and for calling and teaching and preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. He put men and women in, of the church in, in prison, did everything he could to destroy the work of Christ. Yet one day he met the Lord on the road to Damascus and his life was forever changed. That's the story of a life changed. That's the value of a life change. And we can see the change in that person through the Lord Jesus Christ. We could go through the rest of the day and talk about people in the Word of God. Think about Mary Magdalene who was full of devils, seven devils. The Bible says that the Lord cast out of her and she comes to fall at His feet and, and come a believer and follow after Him. Many people that we could go through time and time again. But let me ask you this morning, what about you? What about your witness? What about your testimony? What's the Lord done for you? I want to ask you to raise your hand this morning because we would all be in the same boat. How many of you remember where you were when the Lord pulled you out? How many of you remember what the Lord did in your life? And it doesn't matter if you're five years old when you trusted Christ or if you're 95 years old when you trusted Christ. You were a sinner that was lost and dying and on their way to hell when the Lord Jesus reached down and changed your life and changed your eternal destination to take you from a devil's hell to a home and eternity with Him forever and ever. That's the story of a life that's been changed. There's something that's special about that. There is something that, that does something for other people when they hear about what Christ has done in your life. And when you can point people not to, oh, look at how great I am and what I've accomplished and what I've been able to achieve. But no, look at the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did in my life. And He has the power to do it in your life. Yes, I was out in sin. Yes, I was no good. Yes, I was rotten. Yes, I was lost. But Jesus saved me and He can do the same for you. Let me ask you, are you being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? These are reasons that we can still believe that Jesus was who He said He was because of the Word of God, the works of God, 
and the witnesses for God. Charles Bradlaugh was an atheist in London. There was a man there by the name of Mr. Hughes that was a preacher. And he went to the slums of London and, and he went to, the, to everyone else that would look at these people. They would say, these people are, are horrible and nasty and wretched and, and drunks and, and prostitutes. And they are all sorts of wicked, nasty people that we don't want anything to do with. Those are the people that Mr. Hughes went to and witnessed to and led to the Lord. Hundreds of people he was able to lead to the Lord and change the life of many because of giving them the testimony and witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Mr. Bradlaugh made a public, uh, a public challenge to Mr. Hughes. He said, I want to get together and I would like to debate openly with you. I will present the case for atheism and that there is no God and you can present the case for your Christianity. London waited for a response. Mr. Hughes came back and he responded. He said, I would be happy to publicly and openly debate you. He said, here is what I suggest and what I would challenge you with. He said, I would say and challenge you that each of us should bring some concrete evidence of his teachings and of what his teachings, of what he believes, and the change that has made in people's lives. He said, I will have 200 individuals who with me will testify that the Lord Jesus Christ has changed their life and they are no longer what they once were. He said, if you cannot find 200, he said, then I'll be satisfied if you will bring a hundred people who will be able to say that atheism has changed their life for the better and that they are living a wonderful life because of your atheistic teachings. He said, but if you can't find 100, he said, I tell you what, just bring 50. No, he said, I tell you, if you can't find 50, just bring 20. If 20 cannot be found, just bring 10. He says, if you can't find 10, bring one person who would say that their life is better and that their life has been forever changed because of your atheistic teachings. Once again, London waited to hear the response. Mr. Bradlaugh came out and publicly withdrew his challenge to meet and to talk and to debate with Mr. Hughes. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the only one that can change lives. Amen. Jesus Christ is the only one who can make a difference for eternity in someone's life. Do you know who that Jesus is? Do you know what He's done for you? Listen, beloved, this morning... We can trust that Jesus was who He said He was because of the Word of God, because of the works of God, and because of the many witnesses of God who continue to testify of what Jesus Christ has done in their life again and again and again.